Hey everyone, welcome to episode 45. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer. Today's conversation is with Jenny Guidi, who is a banker and financial advisor in Canada and also happens to be a longtime friend of Sam's. She joined to have a conversation and inform students about the importance of budgeting, setting financial plans, and to explain the differences between uh, different types of bank accounts and investment accounts in Canada, and also uh, to compare and contrast good and bad debt. Budgeting was talked about ex extensively in this episode, and Jenny also shared a link after the fact, um, which is really helpful if you're interested in learning how to make proper budgets. So definitely feel free to visit that link. Um, and there's also some audio troubles throughout the episode periodically, uh, but not that often. Uh, so if you do hear some audio troubles, just realize that uh, it's not just you. Um, it's just the way it ended up being recorded uh, and put together. And fortunately, there was nothing we could do about that. Uh, and also with this, uh, on the 45th episode, this will also be my final episode. Um, I recently passed the CFI and am on track to become a CPA in a short while. And with that comes uh, new and exciting opportunities. So I wanted to leave the door open for someone else or maybe a group of people to be able to take this on and make it their own uh, and work with Sam. So with that, thank you for letting me be a part of 45 episodes, which is quite a few. And, uh, and I'm excited to see what is to come. Thanks. Jenny Greedy, I almost called you by your maiden name. I almost went there. I was thinking about it today and I was like, no, uh, am I pronouncing that correctly? Jenny Greedy. Yeah, beautifully. I've heard some nice variations, but that was perfect. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you have. Um, what was like the most far out where you're like, how did you get this from that? Well, it's funny because it looks so close to Guido except for the last that but li people will literally say guido and it actually had a client who made it a joke like that he i was guido to him and and uh yeah i, I was like it's an eye at the end but whatever <laughs> there's there's all kinds or giddy lots of like people want to say the g's kind of different so yeah it's it's fun <laughs> i find like if i'm looking at it it's like J, I, I wouldn't be able to say like your initials, like JG, like J, G, yeah, J, yeah, J, JG, like, anyways, that's where I'm yeah. probably, <laughs> but I like that. Yeah, hey, Guidi, like, you're like, oh, great, Guido, yeah. you're like, okay, we're not even Jenny, we're gonna go with this. <laughs> yeah, just Guido, like, like, hey, <laughs> um, when you when you change your name, when you got married and change your name, I know for myself, I felt like my maiden name for like the first like three years or something like two to three years, like a while. And I think I was like surveying like my married friends at the time, which were largely you. And I was like, do, do you still feel <laughs> like a, like a maiden name? Do you feel like a, like, where is your identity at? Cause it's part of our identity for so yeah. long. Yeah. It was funny for me. I was like, oh, I got bumped up in the food chain because I went from W, which I was always the last for everything. Like so used to being the last that it's like when I had to renew my um, license plate and it's like, oh, it's in April now and I'm a G like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this like, you know, so it's kind of funny. But the hardest part was the signature because in my job, I signed everything every day, multiple times. So my signature was just such muscle memory that when I would I'd start and then sometimes I have to cross out <laughs> the W E for my maiden name and be like, Oh God, it's this now. Right. And, and do that little, okay. It just changed six months ago, <laughs> but I forgot. So yeah, it's, it's a weird thing, but Kind of like when a new year starts, like um, we're recording this first couple of days into January of 2023 and guaranteed like all next week, um, I'll be like, oh, 2020, oh, no, 2023, oh, no. And like, you know, eventually your brain, because there's things like yeah. you said, the muscle memory, we just do automatically. And then there's things that you kind of become automatic because we do them so often. Yeah, definitely. It's funny too, I think like, I got some um, pictures of a girlfriend's kids and 23 and, and my husband's like, well, what are you doing that with that's this year coming up? I'm like, I am living in the future now. Like I was trying to get so used to doing 2023 coming up that I did it too soon. And yeah, it's that muscle memory thing and trying to get used to those little changes that we have. 
It's interesting because not that we even intended to go here, but muscle memory and those little changes and, you know, those habits, those little habits that out of big ones. I was at pizza last week with a woman and the receipt came and it's not like this is something I was expensing, um, but, you know, I paid for my half, she paid for her half. And then um, the person was like, oh, did you want the, like, the receipt after the tip? And I was like, oh, yes, please. And then the person was like, oh, I pressed it. I can go downstairs. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Can I just borrow your pen? I like put in the tip so that like I had the receipt. And then um, my friend was like, oh, you can have mine too or blah, blah. And I was like, oh no, no, like this isn't for like taxes or anything. This is like for my budgeting. Cause I go home and I have it like, you have your system to kind of track, oh, your budget to actual. And to me, and I, I was explaining it and I saw her just like, it's like, huh? And I was like, is this not normal? <laughs> And it's like, what becomes normal <laughs> to us is what we practice. And it's those small little habits. And then kind of when we get out into the, <laughs> into the world, that's out of like, you know, what your normal is, you realize that other people's normals are, are different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially with something like budgeting, it's so unique to what works for people, what doesn't work, what they do, what, like there's, if you look up like how to make a budget, 150 things are going to come up and it's going to be like, do it this way, this way, this way. And certain things work for certain people. Like I tried the receipt keeping. I hate it. I hate keeping receipts. So, but it it works for, no, but that's great that it works for other people. So it's like, you kind of have to find your thing. And so even if you're doing the same thing, we both have budgets, but it's like, we both do them different and have them different. Right. So it's, it's funny how, you know, you, you kind of look at something, you're like, well, I do it this way and they do it that way. And it's like, well, whatever works, like whatever is going to work for you is what's important. Completely. Yeah. Um, and so I think one of the things that we'll get into in this episode is just talking about what tools are available, what are the pros, what are the cons? And then it's really, uh, I think of it like a number of like webinars or learning things that I go to think of it as a buffet. And then one of the tactics, you know, pick up what you like, but don't pick up what you don't like, or don't want to try mm-hmm. or come back next time and try it again next yeah. time. Like, you know, life in a, in a big yeah. way is a buffet full of hopefully really good options. And hopefully you get to like move up and try different yeah. buffets and it's all okay. Yeah. And yeah, the, I think the receiving things are like, Oh, I don't do that. And I'm like, oh, okay. and, but no, it's, it's all okay. <laughs> um, and you know what, it just because I yeah. do something or we do something for this time and period of our lives doesn't mean it won't change. And that's the fun part of all exactly. of it is it shifts and changes. So how do you just big picture before we discuss tactics, how long um, do you and um, your husband, uh, if it's like a joint effort or how long do you typically try something new before you figure out if it's for you or not for you? And does it change depending on what it is? So typically for me, I found a month. I, if I'm making a budget, I have to stick to it for at least a month before I'm going to decide, no, this is garbage or not, because it's really easy when you're in the heat of the moment to kind of make like quick changes and be like, oh, you know, no, actually this isn't working and I'm going to spend over it, or I'm going to change this amount if you stick to it for the month and you can kind of look back and see, or you're maybe away from that impulse purchase that was going to make you go over in some area or something, you can get a better idea of like, did that actually work? But to the same extent, you don't want to punish yourself in a way. Like if you've made a really important budget, like if, if it's about buying your prescription, I mean, buy your prescription, yeah. you need it. Right. Like, and figure those things out. But I think a lot of people give it at least a month to really see, push it further than that. If you can, um, three months is probably a good way to see is this really working, but if you're feeling it, you know, in month one, it's probably a good idea to reevaluate and start making those adjustments where you need to. Wonderful. All right, so we jumped into the middle, which is what I like to do, um, but perhaps we should <laughs> go back a little bit. Hey, Jenny, uh, how did we meet? <laughs> oh my God, I don't know if you want me to like say the year kind of blow. Maybe not the year. Us, but <laughs> I'll just say, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say the, the grade. We met in grade seven, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was like dance class but junior high for sure grade seven is when we met and uh yeah it's 
yeah, it's just been fun times ever since, you know, for the last 10 years. Yeah, since 10 we've been in. <laughs> just kidding, but uh, <laughs> actually, I just broke my own rule. I, I usually have a rule where if you're going to lie about your age, you're supposed to lie up because it's like, I don't know, I think I look pretty good for 52, oh, right? Yes. So if you say <laughs> yes, yes. lie up and then people will be like, wow, yeah, yeah. It's very true. <laughs> Definitely. If I say I'm like, oh, I'm 18, people are going to be like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when uh when my ex and I broke up I told people that I lost 220 pounds <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, damn exactly. good I'm like fucking happy <laughs> yeah I feel damn good <laughs> funny oh, okay funny. um so yeah great grade seven dance class or something yeah no um yeah, yeah. I um and something like that anyways but I love it yeah damn all good yeah um it's, it's funny too. Cause like, I feel like with us, our friendship was so effortless, like in the sense of like, it just immediately, I felt close. It wasn't something that took a lot of work or a lot of maintenance. It was like just very organic and kind of, I I'm sure that's why we've stayed friends for so long. Cause it's just always been evolving as we do, but but definitely just something that felt so natural and, you know, friend soulmates. <laughs> yeah, totally. And the cool thing on top of that is it's not like we had, we had like overlapping values, but not, um, not necessarily like same or similar uh, interests. Right. So we had lots of varied interests. Yeah. I played sports. <laughs> um, you, Oh, sorry. I think our connection. Sorry about that. Oh, did it freeze? I think oh, it did. Yeah. Okay. So like, sorry. Um, like I still have an arts and crafts uh, hairpin thing that you made for me and like a, like, and it's beautiful and you're so artistic <laughs> and such a talented um, artist. And so like creative and, you know, I played sports and hit people. So, you know, we definitely had our different, <laughs> our different interests and our different talents. Um, but it doesn't mean that we didn't have that like overlap, yeah. which is pretty fun. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I moved out here in 2017 and sometime between grade eight and 2017, what I also loved is it's not like we, like sometimes we would see each other three times in a month and sometimes we'd see each other three times in a year or twice in a year or have a phone call or, um, things ebb and flow. And like, I, I know that you always have my back and I always got yours. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ditto, babe. So one of the reasons why, I don't know, I wanted to have you on for forever. Um, and the really cool thing that popped up like in the past year that I wanted to highlight is, you know, up until mid-June of last year, what were you spending most of your Monday to Fridays doing? Or Monday yeah, to Saturday uh, sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was in the banking world for 15 years. I, uh, yeah, Monday to Friday working at a couple different of the big five banks. I worked at two of the major uh, big five and then finished things off with a, a provincial or crown corporation bank. Um, but I was spending my time doing various roles in the branches. So I did everything from, you know, entry teller to back office processing, setting things up. I did supervising, managing. I did advising, which is where I kind of left things. And yeah, so I spent my time with people. If you were coming into a bank, you probably saw me for something. Well, I would love to put a pin in that because, you know, our audience is uh, management learners. And so we're going to have a wide spectrum. Some people here um, are coming in and they are thinking about wanting to be in investment banking. So they want to be wheeling, dealing corporations and maybe have had bank accounts um, since before they could walk. Um, and we have other students who maybe have a bank account or it's joint with their parents. Um, but we'll have definitely some people either in management, perhaps shared with friends and management learners that have never been into a bank uh, themselves and maybe who are 18 to 22. So I'm going to put a pin in that and we'll revisit. But I said, where were you up until June? And so uh, can you just maybe tell us a little bit about 
um, what happened in June and how you've been able to make it work and if budgeting has had a factor into any of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, in June, uh, me and my husband talked it over and I decided that it was time for me to leave the banking world and take a bit of a break, um, have a reset. My dad had passed away and it kind of was this moment of, okay, time to reevaluate things. He was very young, so he never got a chance to retire. And in the banking world, it's like retirement is so put into your head and planning for that, which is great, but it made me stop and think for a sec, um, you know, about how my life was going, if I was happy with how things were, did I feel successful, was I enjoying what I was doing, and the, the answer was no, and so it's it was time to just pause, put the brakes on, and know that it's not like I was saying I'm never doing it again, but just kind of trying to take some time to sort out what do I want to do? What what can I put my creative energy towards to sort of um, make a change in my life? And it was terrifying, especially, you know, coming from a, a bank background where, you know, I, a budget and having this idea of, okay, you need to go to work and you need to be bringing in this money and, and all of those things. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to visit our budget, first of all, to see, is this even feasible? Can we, can we pay our bills on one income? Can we, you know, do everything that we need to do and me not be working at this job? Does it mean I need a different job? Like, what does that look like? So budget was a big, big, big deciding factor in if I was even going to entertain that idea of doing it. And uh, I sat down, I did the budget and I, I realized like, okay, yeah, we, we can do this. We need to make changes obviously um, because we're going down to one income. So cutting out my entire income, what does that look like? Cause I, I didn't want to be dipping into our savings either for this. So I wasn't including any of money that we had as savings to supplement my income. So yeah, making the budget was the biggest piece or one of the biggest deciding factors in in doing that. So since June, um, I haven't been working. Uh, I don't consider myself unemployed because I'm not looking for work. <laughs> but, uh, just figuring out, you know, what is it that I want to do? What feels good? What did I like about past jobs that I've had? Um, which this is part of it. I loved talking with people and helping them problem solve with their finances. Finances. So um, yeah, it's just kind of, I'm in discovery mode right now and trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> oh my God. You are not the first person um, here to say that. Like, And oftentimes yeah. I still am like, I, I love what I do. If that at the same time, there's more that I want to do too. So I feel like, you know, um, if we're not constantly looking um, and giving ourselves space to look um, and that space looks different depending on life circumstances. And, you know, we can cut any of this out later, but I, I do want to say it's, while the budget is a part of it, it's also looking towards the future uh, in order to put yourself yeah. into a good situation. So I remember a number of years yeah. ago when you and your husband were looking to buy your place, you qualified for this much and yet you spent significantly less. And one of the calculations yeah. that you ran, I believe, was, hey, can we afford this on one income? Because we never know what's going to happen to one of yeah. us. Can you bring us through that thought process? Yeah. yeah, that's something that I actually, I am so, I, I one of the smartest things I think that we did, and I tried to pass that along with people um, when they were looking at buying mortgages as well, there's so many scenarios where your income could drop. So first of all, when you're going and getting qualified at, at the bank for a mortgage, they're qualifying you at the highest amount that they're legally allowed to, right? So you're, you're something called house poor. I'm sure a lot of house poor basically means like, yeah, you've got your house, but you can't do anything else. Or like, what if your furnace isn't working anymore? You can't afford to fix the furnace because your payments fully going into, you know, just having the house. So um, yeah, that was something that was really important. And we wanted to do it based on could, if, if 
something happens. So if one of us lost our jobs, can the other one help float it? Or in this case, you know, I chose to leave my job. Could our income, you know, afford it? Things like that. COVID is another big example of why, you know, there was people who they, they weren't allowed to work at their jobs. So just thinking about, you know, what was more important to me, what, what was the most important to me was being able to pay the bills, not necessarily having a big, you know, lavish house. We have a, a townhouse. It's me, Aaliyah, and our cat. <laughs> so it, we don't need anything crazy, but you kind of get into that loop, especially I found a lot of people where if their friends have bought a certain type of house, they're looking at a certain type of house. And it's like, you're, yeah, you're, you're one guy, get yourself an apartment. You don't need a four level split. Like your best friend who's got four kids has. Right. So it's interesting. I think just there's budgeting and yeah, planning in the future. And I just never wanted to be in a situation where, you know, we were, not able to make choices and that can tend to happen when you put yourself at the the higher end of things or you've bought more than you can manage you're going to put yourself in a situation where your choices are really limited now so when people say things like well the bank wouldn't have qualified me if i can't afford it what is um kind of what are some insights into that so there's there's ground rules that the government has about how much banks are legally allowed to it's like you know loan to people based on their income for um, mortgages but that amount like I said it doesn't take into consideration like what if your furnace stops working that's not a negotiable you can't maybe have a furnace when you live in Canada like you need your furnace or you know can you afford your house and your oil changes on your truck or whatever like it doesn't take into consideration all of the extra expenses that we have. So when you're doing an application with the bank, it's like, they're going to look at, yeah, what are your loan payments? How much debt do you have? What's your income? But they're not going to ask you, and Sam, do you eat filet mignon? What's yeah. your food like? What's your budget like? Yeah, hey, Jenny, I, serious I like to go on changes. vacations twice a year. Hey, Jenny, I'm part of a, a yeah. hockey league. Or hey, Jenny, I do this and this. They don't yeah. ask you about your lifestyle, what you like to do. Yeah, it's not it's not considered when you're qualifying. So you're approved, but the bank doesn't know that you're spending. Yeah. And hockey, that's a good one. Like kids hockey. My God, when I found out how expensive that is, like Adult there's hockey. a lot of expenses. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Well, and, and the thing is, too, is even a lot of times if I had a young couple come in, mm. I would ask them, you know, what are the plans with kids? And it's like that might seem intrusive, but you have to think about it because if you're going to have kids, okay, does that mean to raise the kids? So we have two incomes right now, but are we going to be down to one income for potentially 10 years? Or are you going back to work? Like what is the scenario? And so it's really important to think about those things when you're getting into any kind of big change, right? Like it's, it's important to think about what could happen and what would you do if your income is dropped down or what the case may be? Totally. And the thing is, it's like, there's all this advice out there and all these like rules and the government rules and regulations and all this stuff is good. At the same time, nothing, it's like going back to the buffet analogy, um, nothing out there replaces your ownership that you need to take as an individual because you know your, yeah. you know your individual um, goals, you know, your individual, uh, you know, desires, you know, if you would like kids or, you know, because what if yeah. you're qualified on two incomes without the kid expense, and then all of a sudden you decide, hey, um, one spouse really wants to stay home with the kids, income goes down, expenses probably go up with kids. Like I haven't heard ever that they go down. So, you know, yeah. you have to understand, but conversely, there will be some personal finance law, um, information out there that will say, oh, no, no, you want to buy as big of a house as you can and have as big of a mortgage because yeah. over time, your income will go up and so will house prices. So really by taking on as much debt as possible, you're creating arbitrage and you're investing in your future. And if that's what you 
if that's what you want or you think you want by comparison, it's easy to look at that part of the buffet and taking that information without necessarily saying what is in the best interest for me, my family, sleeping at night and you know, having yeah. a house is cool. Uh, having a townhouse is cool. Having a piece of property. But you know what's cool? Going to bed uh, with peace of mind and not worrying about, oh, shoot, what if I get sick? Oh, shoot, what if um, we can't work? Oh, shoot, what if like this only works if X, Y, and Z happen? Peace of mind is is priceless. So for the remainder of this <laughs> podcast, you know, we're going to dive into things that are you know, how does this work? And then how are some things that possibly went wrong? Because we are talking, Jenny, people will like shit on these kids and they are brilliant. Like I am so, and I say this and I mean like society, right? They'll be like, oh, like they have, they want to travel. They want this, they want that. And they want it all. It's like, yeah, but they're not saying that they don't want to work for it. They just don't want to accept society's narrative of what work is or what success looks like. So, um, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah. I'm pretty excited to work with these kids because um, I think this year was the first yeah. year where uh, the parents can be around the same age as me <laughs> for the kids in my class. So like, <laughs> we, we, we have like, uh, usually, <laughs> like sometimes yeah. um, they'll be telling me about their parents and I'm like, your, your mom sounds cool. <laughs> like, where's your mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um, and I have some kids uh some students that like um bring, bring like their ask if they can bring their boyfriend or girlfriend to class and it's wonderful and I'm waiting I'm waiting I'm like where is my parent <laughs> like, <where> is- yeah. <laughs> all right so we are a young adult we are 18 to 22 um no no parents in sight um they walk into a bank and I've had one student flat out say listen I work I make sure I save money above my paycheck, but, and I want to go to the bank and I want to understand what the different vehicles are, I, but I don't, I'm, I feel scared to go into a bank because I'm afraid that the person will take advantage of me, or I'm afraid that I, I will be stupid and not know what to ask the right questions or, you know, so I would just love to know somebody comes in um, to the bank or maybe they call ahead and they meet with you as a financial advisor um, or somebody like you now. What should they expect during a first appointment? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's different. It's going to be different depending on who you see and even which bank. Like, for example, I worked for one bank. They were very uh, scripted, I'll say. Like, they had specific things, directions they wanted meetings to go and whatnot. So you might meet with... Jenny and it sounds like this but you also meet with John and no John's saying the exact same things Jenny said so it can depend on the bank um in regards to the feeling taken advantage of there are predatory people like there are in any industry where you know they're maybe just trying to push a sale or something like that um so sign anything right you can go to a meeting and if you don't like what they're saying or you feel like you know, I don't want to do this right now, that's fine. And if the person or the advisor that you're meeting with is like, no, we have to do this today. No, you don't. You can leave. Like, don't feel pressure. If you're not understanding something, please ask. Because the thing is, is like, it's, it's our job to know, or it was my job to know these things. It's not what you're in and what you're doing every single day. And sometimes I was guilty of this myself. I don't know what people don't know, you know, and it's, it's not until you're talking with them and you say, you know, Oh, TFSA. And they're like, and you're like, Oh, sorry, tax free savings account. And, you know, and and then people start to pick up or it's, it's different each person that you come in with and even each age level. I mean, you know, I've met 18 year olds who know more than 45 year olds in regards to banking and the account types available and options. So, Don't ever feel like you can't ask a question, number one. Uh, Definitely don't feel intimidated like you have to do whatever the person is saying. You can take some time and think about it. But typically what would happen is it should be getting to know you and why are you here? So what brings you in today? Like what, what brought you in? Why are you here? What got you into the front door sitting in the seat talking to me? And you should be open to tell people or tell the advisor, about what got you here. So, oh, I need an account. Okay, well, why do you need an account? You know, just because the more information that we know can better help 
determine what type of account would be a good idea for you or option for you, what solutions are there that can kind of help you tackle some of your problems. So it's really a lot of discovery. What are you, you know, looking to do today? What are your goals? Short term, medium term, long term? A lot of people, <laughs> when I would meet with clients, I'd, you know, be like, tell me about your goals. They think they didn't have any. And it's like, no, you do. You just aren't realizing that it's maybe a goal that I'm thinking about. So for example, travel would be one. And it's like, somebody might have a goal that they want to go to, I don't know, Vietnam next year. And it's like, okay, cool. That's also a financial goal. Do you have the money for that trip yet? Like how, how are you going to, what are your payment options when you're there? So those are, it's, it's so tied into lots of goals. Like tell me about your goals because maybe I can make a suggestion or help tweak some things or help you get there. So talking about your goals, how do you do your banking? What's your banking right now? Like, do you have a bank account? Do you have you know, a credit card? Do you use a debit card? Do you just get allowance money and you're buying everything with cash? Like, tell me about how do you make purchases? What are you doing for your banking right now? Um, so that's part of the, the first appointment. It shouldn't be intimidating, but it is very intimidating for a lot of people. There was this statistic I'd seen a couple years ago and it was like, they pulled, I think it was people under 25 and they said they'd rather go to the dentist than the bank. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, right? Yeah, like they're, they're so worried about it. It was like, it's super important to get this, you know, right and to be comfortable in what you're doing. Um, being comfortable with the person that you're talking to, I kind of think of it as like, a little bit like how you find a hairstylist or you find your, your, you know, your guy that you buy cars from or whatever you, you need to have that connection with your advisor too, or trust that okay, I can ask this person, these questions that I have. Um, but yeah, the first appointment is basically like, what do you need? And that looks different for everybody as well. Cause like I said, you, you might be someone like, I think I was three years old when my bank account was opened up for me. So I had, you know, but then you meet someone who's in their twenties and they've never needed one because their source of income has just been cash from presents and allowance and, you know, paper route or whatever. So it's different. Yeah. Or somebody has that, you know, bank account from when they were three and they realize, oh, wait, my parents can see all my transactions in here. And maybe that's okay <laughs> if the parents are putting all the money in and that's part of the deal, you know, if that's what two people have agreed to. But then mm -hmm. there might be some point where, you know, you're 18, you're serving um, and you're, you know, having transactions coming out. And if that's not part of what you would like, if you are, you know, self um, self funding your future, if you don't want your mom and dad to be able to see all your transactions, you know, maybe it's time to go into yeah. the bank or at least ask the bank, hey, is there anybody else on my account? Yeah. I think I saw or I was listening to a podcast a long time ago and it was somebody who had their parent on and then um, there was some drug situations and their parent actually drained their bank account. Or it was like, yeah. And, and you know, so not that, you know, things happen. And I remember I always yeah. like just to, I like, I, I value some privacy or I value some like, you know, what's yeah. not just going with the status quo because it's there and it's easy. It's like, how can I spend an hour to this week so that the rest of like the next five years are easier or that I can just sleep better? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and even it, your account type. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, that's, that's checking what I in and making through. sure is that still, yeah, like a couple, a couple of clients, you know, if, if, a lot of banks have, you know, youth accounts or student accounts and they go up to a certain age. So if you're someone like me where an account was open when you're three, well, you can have that until you're 18 and then they're going to change it to a different account right. type. And maybe you're paying way more in service fees than you should. So it's really important or maybe you shouldn't be paying them at all and it should be changed to a student account. So there's, you know, you have to check in on that stuff and it's worth it. It's worth knowing, you know, what you have and what you need. Oh my gosh. If somebody was like, oh, well, I'm paying $7 a month now. Um, what does that matter? It's like, oh gosh, this just adds up. And at, the, at some point I'm like, well, if you're paying $7 a month and you're a student for four years and you could have that waived, like, wouldn't you rather have anything other than bank fees? <laughs> like anything other than seven times 12? That's like a coffee from Starbucks a month. 
Yes. Like <laughs> just anything. Um, okay. So I would love to run down just a few um, bank accounts and what are the differences. So we'll do a little bit of bank rapid fire, but you don't have to be rapid fire in your answers if, if it doesn't do. So bank accounts, checking versus saving. What's the difference? Yeah. So checking account is where you're going to do your day-to-day -day transactions. Typically, this is your account that you want your payroll to go into or that you're putting your income into. And it's kind of the spot where, yeah, you need a coffee, you want your gas, your day-to-day, your -day, everything kind of, that's where you plunk that money. Savings, on the other hand, um, I mean, people, some people have multiple savings accounts. So you, you like, depending on how you budget, you might have three savings accounts, right? And this one is for fun money and this one is for rainy day or whatever. But essentially, it's just an account to take money out of that everyday spending where it could kind of get lost and move it to keep it separate. So it's a really great budgeting tool. Or for some people, it's just where they put excess or whatever money that they're not needing for their everyday day to day banking. It's a way to kind of separate it. The other thing, too, is a checking account typically would have a monthly fee. Um, some of them have monthly fee waivers, depending on the balance of your account. That's another situation. But savings accounts typically don't have a monthly fee. However, you don't want to be withdrawing from them because guaranteed they're going to be charging you like five bucks or more for withdrawals from those accounts. So anything like if you're at, you know, Safeway buying groceries, you don't want to buy it from your savings account because you're going to get charged five dollars for that transaction, most likely. A lot of banks, there's not a fee if you transfer money. So let's say you had money in your savings account that you ended up needing for your oil change or whatever. You can online or with your mobile app transfer money over to your checking account and use it from there. But you don't want to make purchases or things directly from the savings account. Okay, that's that's great. Um, can you, like, I know that the answer two years ago would have been no, but uh, now when we see kind of higher interest rates, uh, is there um, ever interest rate? Like, um, could they earn interest on either type of account? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So a lot of savings, it's, it's very minuscule, honestly, even with the changes that have happened to interest rates. Savings on, or interest rates that you earn on a t just general savings account are very, very low, but checkings accounts, you don't earn interest on those accounts. So you're going to earn a little baby bit. They're going to, you know, kind of reward you for keeping money in there and keeping it separate. But um, yeah, you, you typically do. Some accounts, you don't start earning interest until you've met a minimum balance. So for example, a savings account, you might make thousand dollars in it really depends on your bank. So banks have the same products, but they're smidgy smidge different with each thing that the features that they have on them cool so then relating back to well i'm going to keep going because i feel like all of mm -hmm. this would likely come up when you tell the financial advisor your your story and your history and what you're saving for and they would help kind of right. like recommend certain things but in order to make right. it a relationship understanding what these different types are kind of can help okay um mm -hmm. so now we have banking accounts we know the difference between checking and savings then we also have kind of more investment accounts. So we have regular accounts, non-tax sheltered, but then we also hear about tax-free savings accounts, TFSA, and RSP, Registered Retirement Savings Plans. So all of these yeah. um, have the word savings in them, and yet people don't just save in these accounts. So can you please tell me the difference between what a regular non-tax tax sheltered, a TFSA, and an RSP are? Yeah, so the the features of the account are different, but otherwise they're basically the same kind of thing. So I'll just um, kind of bulk a TFSA and RSP in the same kind of registered group first. Uh, the, the best way I found explaining these accounts to people was to think of it like a house. So the tax-free savings account is a house, the RSP is a house. So in a house, you have different rooms. You have your bathroom, you have your kitchen, you have your bedroom, and you do different things in those rooms. That's what a TFSA is. It's the whole house. So within that TFSA, you can have different rooms in there. Whereas with your regular checking or savings, it's just, it is what it is. It's a checking account or it's a savings account. So RSP, TFSA are different because you have different investment options available to you 
in those different rooms. So for example, in a TFSA, you might have a GIC room where you have, you know, guaranteed investment certificates, which is a type of investment product or mutual fund portfolios, which is another type of investment product, or just, I would call it the lobby of the house, just a cash component where you're just plunking in cash. So even though I it's an investment stocks. account, can stock yeah. go in there? <laughs> you can have a stock room, <laughs> but yeah, so it has different spaces within that one account. So that's kind of think of an RSP TF to say those are like houses and the rooms you have different options so that's one way that they're different from a regular savings account the next thing rsp is a tax deferred uh type of savings account so the main purpose for rsp the reason it was brought out was for retirement savings just like it says in the name what happens is it's going to defer the taxes that you pay based on your contributions so everybody has different contribution limits depending on their previous year's income. So that's going to look different for everybody. Um, but basically what happens, we'll just use really round numbers because math, yeah. <laughs> but basically like, let's say you made a hundred thousand dollars and you put $5,000 into an RSP. When you do your taxes, you're going to be doing it on $95,000. However, when you take that 5,000 out, hopefully later in the future, because you don't want it to bump you up into the next tax bracket, you're gonna be taxed at hopefully a lower amount. So not right now, you don't pay taxes now, you're gonna pay it later when you withdraw it, which is really important to remember <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times people would come in to do withdrawals from their RSPs and there's something called withholding tax where the bank will basically claw back a portion. So if you're saying, you know, I wanna withdraw 5,000, we'd ask you net or gross, because we might have to withdraw, I don't know, 7,000 to get out the actual amount that you need because of withholding tax. So RSP main purpose, main focus of that was for retirement. It's not how everybody used it. Um, they also had a feature that's changing this year. They're coming out with a new account, um, but you could use it towards a down payment of a house. Um, with the home buyers plan. Now, I'm not super familiar with the new account that's coming out, but it's along the same lines of what the RSP did with a down payment for buying your first house. So RSP, just think retirement. It, that's really what it's for. Set it, forget it. It's really just for retirement is the main function. Kind of get in a scenario where a lot of people think everybody needs an RSP and that's not necessarily... Um, true. It's very different for everyone. And, and to get the actual benefits of it, for example, if you're a, a lower income earner, you're maybe not going to reap the rewards of deferring taxes because you're going to pay taxes on it later anyway. So it's just paying it later versus bumping you down a, a tax bracket. And actually, like, ideally, your investment would grow in there. So you put in 5000 mm -hmm. and in seven years, hopefully it's 10000 so then you, yeah. you are like a lower income earner and you put away money and then it ends up just instead of paying tax on whatever that 5,000 is this year, then you're paying tax on the $10,000 in the future. You might actually be putting yourself in a tax disadvantage, which is why having yeah. those conversations with a financial advisor that you trust and, um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, finding that relationship and um, figuring out and also understanding what the purpose of these vehicles are. So if you are a low mm -hmm. income earner, um, there is maybe like, I want to know a little bit more about the TFSA and, and understand how that works. Yes. Yeah. So the tax-free savings account is a tax sheltering account. So what that means is the money that you put in is after tax dollars. So you're not going to get the same deduction like you would an RSP if you made $100,000 you're going to, if you put in 5,000 in a TFSA, you're paying taxes on 100,000 still. So it doesn't give you that tax deferral. The benefit of the tax-free savings is that, let's say you put that 5,000 in and it grows and, and you're earning income on it. You don't have to, or sorry, you're, you've earned interest or it's grown and, and you have more money in the account now. You don't have to pay taxes on that growth. So back to regular savings account we talked about in the first place, You'd have to put an astronomical amount of money in to really get a, a good amount of interest on that. But I believe it's about $50 of interest is where they you get your T5 slip and you pay taxes on it, right? But um, yeah. basically what happens is in a regular 
regular savings account, once you've earned so much interest, it's essentially considered like income and you get a tax slip and you have to claim it in your taxes and pay tax on it. Tax-free savings account, let's say you put in your 5,000 and you know by the end of the year you invested it well and now it's worth 7,000, that 2,000 is tax sheltered. So you're not gonna be putting it in your um, taxes that you've earned that $2,000. So it shelters it. It's a really great account for anything, honestly. Um, I've seen people use that account for saving for down payments, for saving for trips, just nothing like rainy day savings, like anything you really want to save for, that can be a really good account to do that in. Um, it's not quite as liquid as a savings account, like just a regular savings account that you have with your checking in the sense that you can't, you know, use your debit card to pay for something with it or quite as easily access the money, especially if it's invested. So it can be a bit of a deterrent to take money out as well, which can be really beneficial for people. Um, Tax-free savings accounts have contribution limits that are unique to you based on your age. So the account was created in 2009. So if you were 18 before 2009, you have the um, contribution room since 2009 that you could put in, which up to this year is 88,000. So they've been different amounts, <laughs> random amounts. Uh, this year for 2023, 6,500. Last year was 6,000. We had a rogue 10,000 year. <laughs> it started out with 5,000. So it's kind of all over the place. There are calculators you can use online where you just put in the year that you turned 18 and it will tell you exactly quick and easy what your contribution room is, what you're allowed. So the year you turn 18 is the year that you start to get room. Um, so for example, let's say I turned 18 last year, the limit was 6,000, um, it's 6,500 this year, and I didn't use any of last year's room, it's going to follow me to this year. So this year I would be able to put in 2,500 because I have 6,000 from last year and 6,500 from this year. So contribution room is really important because there's penalties for over contributing. So just talk with your advisor as well. That should be something, you know, when I had a client, if they were doing contributions, I'd be like, okay, let's take a look at this and make sure that you're not, you know, that you're well within your room. Because what happens as well is you don't regain your room if you withdraw until the following year. Hmm. So let's so say, you're putting, let's in, say putting, putting in, putting in, uh, putting out, you could. Yeah. Exactly. You don't get the room back until next year. So if last year I put in 5,000, that means this year I'd have 1,000 still more. And then I would have the 6,500. So technically 7,500 this year. But let's say I had withdrawn, you know, another thousand last year. I wouldn't have 2,000 until next year. I'd still only have 1,000 room. So it can get a little bit tricky. It's talking it out loud. I usually have pen and paper and would like kind of write it down because these things can get tricky. So talking with your advisor and just telling them, I mean, you don't want to be using your account for just in, out, in, out kind of things, like you said. Um, but certainly there's no penalty to withdraw from the account. You just won't earn that contribution room again. Now, if you're someone who, like I say, you, you were over 18 in 2009 and you have $88,000 worth of room, you might have some wiggle room to be able to, you know, put in 5,000, take out four, put in another five, you know, because you have that room to do it. But if you're brand new to the game, just turned 18 kind of thing, you want to be more careful with your limits. It's interesting because um, that taking out, putting in um, and the complexity, especially if you're not familiar with it. Listen, my, uh, my old boss at one of the jobs I was consulting at uh, is uh, a chartered accountant. So his whole thing was making like at a multi-billion dollar corporation and he over coffee was kind of like oh shit like I over contributed for like my wife and I this year because we moved some stuff we did this and it was very early in the game um like TFSAs were a few years out and he got like a bill for two thousand dollars or something and it was like hey listen like let's just write them a letter and ask for forgiveness and he looked at me and I was like yeah just write him a letter write the check like you know I pulled up like the the order of operations and I'm like like let's just let's do this it's worth like 20 minutes let's just try at yeah. worst like they laugh they rip it up and they have your money and <laughs> so, so him being like a chartered accountant you know that again 
does this for a living, but in a different aspect, um, didn't know that you could, you know, just fast up and pay. Anyways, long story short, six months later, he finds another letter that comes in and is like, oh, thank you very much and returned his check and said, hey, like, we understand you made oh. a mistake. Thank you for letting us know. Yeah, we'll accept um, this as a one-off. We, re- we record in your file. If this happens yeah. again, you'll be charged a penalty. But so again, talking with your financial advisor, talking with people, finding out information, um, because there is a lot of good information on the internet. It's just how do you, Mm -hmm. you know, communicate openly with people because there might be things that, you know, you you just don't know. So, you know, talk to talk to people. We spoke briefly before um, recording this, that one of the stats that came out in the last year is that three quarters of Canadians are finding it more difficult to meet their, their daily basic needs. So, if you have, a, like, impaired with your com- your uh, stat, the more people would like to go to the dentist than visit a bank. Like, if we <laughs> can get if we can get this stuff out there, so that people are, you know, maybe sitting in class and are like, hey, like, where do you put your extra money? Or hey, do you have extra money? Yeah. Or like, hey, how are you paying rent this month? Like, if you can just talk about these things, I think we'd all be better off for it. And I feel like Gen Z are definitely more apt to you know to to share openly with each other for a number of things including hopefully financial matters yeah yeah uh one thing i'll quickly add yeah. about the tfsa um is is that you can have multiple tfsas your contribution room <laughs> is uh, for you stretched across so i'll just add that because i have seen that with clients before and sorry just wanted to kind of go back no, to that is you. yeah you can have five tfsas that doesn't mean that you have five times the limit your limit, like back to that 18 year old last year is 12,500 spread across the 12 accounts, not per each one. So keep that in mind because different people have different TFSAs as well. Like maybe you have one on Wealth Simple or something and your bank's telling you to open one or whatever. Totally fine. You can do that. Same with RSPs, but your contribution room doesn't, it doesn't, it's not per account. It's per you. <laughs> so no, that's, just, yeah quickly jump back to that. This this is the thing is it gets confusing. And I think the thing too, like what you said, how, you know, Gen Z is talking to each other. Thank God. Cause there's a difference between me going, so Sam, what do you make per year versus like us having a conversation about like, Hey, when you book trips, do you use like a rewards card or, or did you pay cash debit travelers checks? Like, what are you doing? And, and that's the thing is talking with people you can get some great ideas. And I think there's more value to talking to a person than looking it up online. Tons of information online, but what are the people in your community doing? Yeah. Who's around you? Because if you're going to start comparing yourself, like this is the thing that happens. And it even where I'm seeing people getting into debt when they're going through their information online or they're comparing themselves with people who are, it's, apples and oranges like yeah it's easy for someone who's got a shit ton of money to say well save x percentage amount and it's like well that might not be in your budget doesn't mean you're a failure right so talk to the people who are around you about like hey what are you doing or oh I noticed like I had a friend ask me one time she's like you're always at the movies what's up and I'm like oh I've got this rewards card I got free movies and so talk with each other and and definitely I mean it's there's this quote too that's kind of funny it's almost in reverse and it's something along the lines of um if if a poor person is making fun of the way you budget you're doing something right (laughs) because it's like don't necessarily take advice from everybody or take everything everybody's saying you know as the gospel because there's people who are doing things that aren't right either so take everything with a grain of salt um but listen and have those conversations so that you kind of know what's out there. What are the options? What are you doing? How did you save for your down payment? How's this working for me? And how's it, you know, Yeah, I I love, that's another thing. You love movies. uh, And I, you know, I I, like was all about the reward cards for travel and like, but you know, so we figured out our own thing, but still talked. And even before we went on live here, we were talking about ways in which we save money at the groceries, you know, at the grocery (laughs) store and the different tactics that are out there, but then what works for each, each one of us and what, and just being cognizant and because like life strategies, anyways, I find, I find that very interesting. And our students are way smarter than they, they even think they are. So for example, we were doing bank reconciliations in class 
And the same, a lot of the same principles that we use for corporations apply to humans. So I asked them, like, show of hands, how many people here have done a bank reconciliation before for a company or for yourself? These are first years. They're like, are you smoking? Like, <laughs> they're like, I'm 18. This is my first <laughs> month. Like, what's going on? And one person was like embarrassed. Yeah. They're like, I have to be one. And the rest of them are like, no, lady, I know. <laughs> so then we go through and I'm like, okay. And so like, you're going out shopping, you want your Starbucks and you know, you get your Starbucks or it's declined or something happens. And you realize that the money that you think you have in your account and the money that you actually have in your account are different. What do you do? And they're like, some people like, I go to the bank and I get a printout. Other people are like, I call other people. Like everybody had an action. Nobody was like, I do nothing. And so like, that is a form yeah. of bank reconciliation. <laughs> like they are, they are doing the thing. And one girl was like, I found like there was a mischarge. Like it shouldn't have been there. There was fraudulent activity. I got them to refund. And at first yeah. they were like, that's not a mistake. And then I said it was that I, you know, and I'm like, I love this. Cause she's like advocating for herself. And so it turns out that over three quarters of our class have done a bank reconciliation. They just didn't use those terms. So yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool that like the intuition and the knowledge that's out there and have been already being absorbed in the advocacy. Uh, and so, yeah, a few more like tools, a few more like, you know, nomenclature, like understanding the different accurate like alphabet soup and, and off to the like, races. Yeah. Okay. So debt, yeah. debt, debt, debt. Um, I, if I bring myself back to 21 year old Samantha, uh, and I think about myself and students around me, some people had student loans, some people had um, credit card debt, and some people ha were about to get a car loan. And some people had saved up um, or received scholarships or financial support uh, and had none of them. So, you know, we might be dealing with people that have all of those or none of those. I guess, what are the different types of debt and what are the pros and cons of each? Yeah, so um, part of my bank career, I spent in collections for a bank where I was, well, let me put it this way. The job was pitched to me a little different than what it actually was, but essentially um, I went in like starry eyed thinking, oh, I get to help people with, you know, and it's like not so much of that. It was more like pay up. We're taking your house. So I've seen the ugliest side of debt. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because I, I saw that part, part before I got into an advisory position where I was actually gonna be recommending products um, or solutions that would get people in into debt, let's say, or that. Um, I'm really grateful because I've seen how absolutely horrifically ugly it can be. And I'm not saying this to scare people because I know that there, there is already just with that word, I was probably making faces like I cringe when I, I think about it. There is good and bad debt. So it's different. It depends. Um, basically, let's just talk about, because this is really, really broad as well, but there's different types of debt in regards to something being secured or unsecured. So secured debt is your car loan. What that means is, you know, you, you went to a dealership, you got a loan for your car. Essentially, that car is collateral if you stop paying your loan. So it's secured. The loan is secured by that car in the sense that, you know, you're not making payments. We're taking that vehicle. And in Alberta, we might sue you as well. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's collateral in the sense that it's tied specifically to the property or sorry, to the, uh, yeah, to the property of whatever it is, a vehicle or a mortgage. For example, mortgage is a secured debt because your home is securing that loan. So if you stop making payments on your mortgage, and the bank's going to come in and take the house. Not that they want to, because let me be very clear, the bank doesn't want to seize your property. It's not beneficial for them. Um, it costs them a lot of money and legal fees and things like that. That's not the ultimate goal for you to get a mortgage and the bank to rip it away from you. That's not what they want or to take your car. But secured property or secured loans. 
the bank that. wants you to mm -hmm. get as much debt as you can and charge you as much as they legally can and have you in <laughs> debt for as long as possible. So it's not like we're out here shilling for the banks, like yeah. Jenny's not working at one yeah. for, you know, a reason. Um, but at the same yeah. time, they yeah. just want that sweet, sweet interest rolling in. They don't actually want, they, they're not in that, in the business of owning houses and cars. Exactly. And the thing is too, just to touch point on the interest, it's, it's interesting how many people are signing on the line and they're fine with their interest rate in the moment. And then a year or two later, they're furious. Why is my interest rate this amount? It's like, remember last year you were, you wanted this, right? So it's a contract that you're getting yourself into with dealerships or banks or whoever is loaning you money where you're they'll say we're giving you this money and you're going to in exchange give us this much in interest to make bi-weekly or monthly or whatever kind of payments right so it's an agreement it's a contract um the other type of debt is unsecured so just meaning in the sense that there is no anything like that tied to it however <laughs> it doesn't mean if you stop making payments towards it that potentially those things aren't at risk so for example you have a mastercard you've racked it up and you're not making your payments the bank can take legal action and garnish your wages they can put a lien on your house all kinds of fun stuff so bottom line with debt is stick to your end of the agreement so whatever that is if it's that you you know you're gonna pay this much interest and you pay it weekly monthly whatever it is stick to that um debt and credit scores so credit score is so important so important the way that it impacts your life and going forward huge like i can't stress enough how important it is to strive for a good credit score because it impacts the kinds of interest rates that you're getting whether you're approved for a loan or not um all kinds of things. So how do you get a credit score? Well, basically you have to open a credit product. So if you're someone brand new coming in, you would typically have like an NH rating, no history rating, and that's normal. We can justify and go, okay, well, you know, Tim is only 18. He's never had a credit card. This is his first one, $500 limit to get his feet wet kind of thing, right? So what Tim has to do with that credit card now to build his credit is use it. <laughs> a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, just have it. And if I don't use it, it's going to look so good. Look at my self-control. No, it just looks like you have something you don't need and you're not using it and it doesn't do anything. You want to use it, you need to pay it. So options with paying a credit card are you can do minimum payments or full balance payments or somewhere in between the two. Minimum payments are the minimum amount that you are allowed to pay to the credit card, depending on how much you owe. This is the never, never plan. You will never get out of debt if you make your minimum payments every single month. It's never getting paid off. It's the never, never plan. But if you're having a tight month or it's, you know, some things come up and you're not able to pay off the full balance, you have to make at least the minimum payment. If you make your minimum payments, your credit score is going to be golden. So you're fine. So a lot of people worry about that. Like if I don't have enough to pay off my whole trip, yeah, that's okay, but make at least the full minimum payment. Would it, Did you have something at looked yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would a decent strategy be to like for somebody building credit or maybe they're like, you know what, I might not need credit ever or, and maybe that's that's good if you're like, hey, um, but if you want to build credit, maybe getting that smaller, the $500 thing and then putting your monthly expenses on there. So if you're going to go to Starbucks or you're going to go to a movie, put it on there and then transfer the money right away over so that it's almost like, um, you know, depending on how many transactions you get for your um, checking account, but you're almost using it like, like a checking account, like you're playing a game and you're like, yes. okay, I'm going to build my credit, but I don't want to just forget about it. So I'll only spend what I have. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, highly recommend that strategy. You have to be on the ball with it. And thankfully, because of, you know, a lot of, I'm pretty sure every mobile or every bank has a mobile app now. Um, I got into the habit where I'd use my card and I'd use it for literally everything like $2 Tim's coffee credit, please. Because sometimes with your card, you're getting cash back, you're getting travel rewards, you're getting who knows what, like there's perks to it that you're not going to get with your debit card. So there's a little bit of incentive to use it that way. But then at the end of each day, I was transferring the money from my checking account 
over to my credit card. Now, um, a lot of times if you're making a payment from the same checking, like from a checking account that's at bank A and you're paying bank A's credit card, it doesn't count as a debit transaction. So this is where we're getting checking accounts. It can, <laughs> we're going oh, can of worms here. So there's, uh, there's different types of transactions with each account that you'll need to know which is best suited for you. There are unlimited accounts, but if you're going to use your credit card in that way, you don't necessarily need it to be an unlimited account, but you just want to be careful if you have bank account with bank A, but credit card with bank C, they may count you making a bill payment to that card as debit transaction. So just be careful about that. Talk with your advisor. Say, this is what I want to do. They can let you know based on their account. Yeah, that would work. Or, well, you might end up paying like 30 bucks a month in service fees if you do that. So talk with your advisor. Um, but certainly that's a really good strategy to do because it's going to, it's essentially acting like your debit card then and you're building your, um, your, your credit rating, your credit score. People with a bad credit score, it can get ugly because if you're in a situation where let's say your car's died and you need a loan and you have to have a car to get to work, transit's not, transit is not super friendly here in Calgary for a lot of places. So some places you do need a vehicle and if you can't get that, you know, loan to get a car, well, now your job's in jeopardy as well. So there's you know, all kinds of ramifications for having bad credit scores. I've heard that a lot of landlords are checking credit scores as well. So even if you've paid your rent all the time and it's been you know, every other landlord you had, if you're trying to move in somewhere new and they're seeing that you have a low score, you might not get in because of that, because it's a risk. So utilities. Yeah. You yeah. Never, even if you're kind of quote, anti, anti debt, um, yeah. there's, there's unforeseen kind of consequences of that. So yeah. yeah. Um, you yeah. listen, it's, what is it? Don't hate the player, hate the game to figure out how to, <laughs> how to navigate and the rules yeah. within there. I would say one more thing, October, I think it was 19th of last year, certain stores or not certain stores, sorry, uh, stores can flow through credit card charges, um, for MasterCard or Visa. So you now have to like kind of go into the store and make sure that if they're going to flow it through, they kind of say, hey, we can add 2.5% for every transaction. Yeah. So then you're yeah. like, wait, wait a minute, I will use my debit card for this kind of store. So consumers, yes. um, students, consumers, we, we have to be like very vigilant out there because there's so many costs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's something like, I mean when you when you think business sense you're like okay well yeah that makes sense like for example one of the reasons why amex is not as commonly accepted is it costs merchants a lot more to be able to have their service well the reason that is is because people who have amex typically can get better benefits a lot of times so it has to get paid from somewhere but it's important to know that that's yeah that's something that and i haven't come across any stores that are doing it yet okay. but <laughs> It is something that they're allowed to do. And so that's that's where you really have to think like, yeah, is it worth it? Because I banked this way my whole life, but one baby little thing changes and I'm not going to do it that way anymore. So I like to tell people, and even with my clients, I'd like to talk to them at least once a year, yeah. at least once a year, just to refresh and check up. How are you banking? What's changed? Has your income changed? Is it high? Is it low? What's your future plans? Like, Checking in, like when you go to the doctor, you don't have to be sick to go for your physical. You you go and you get your checkup and you, you're good to go, right? Um, and again, there back to that, you know, if your advisor is recommending things or saying things, you're like, I don't think I need that or I don't like the sound of that. You're in charge. You are the one that gets to say, eh, let me think about that or no, I, I don't think I need that. That's totally fine. The advisor is going to bring it up because... Maybe they think it's helpful for you. Maybe they think that it's something you could benefit from. Maybe it could be just part of their own sales targets or whatever. And that's a whole other thing. But you ultimately get to decide. You don't go into a bank and something happens. Say, yes, I like this. No, I don't think that sounds good for me. 
doesn't mean if you're saying no today that you can't in a year decide, you know, we're actually a member. You told me about that credit card. I had that happen with clients too, is where they'd say, you know, I kind of thought it over and yeah, I will get a credit card to just, I, I need to book my trip. And I didn't realize it's like, yeah, you have to have a credit card on file for that kind of thing. Right. So um, you mentioned something about people who, you know, are very scared of debt. They don't want to have those kinds of things. It's, almost unavoidable. I mean, unless you're going to, you know, marry Jeff Bezos or something and you don't need to worry about any money ever and you're going to buy your house in cash, you need to build your credit rating. And there's nothing saying that you can't have a credit card that you are using responsibly. I had a client who did not want to use their credit card and I said, fine, cut the card up, have the account though, and they would have their um, NMAX come off of their credit card and then it was just the account that their mmax came out of and they transfer it building their credit score they're not at a store tapping away with useless you know impulse buys but it's a way to establish your credit like hey i have this i can be trustworthy with credit which is really what your credit score is saying is are you responsible and trustworthy do you keep your end of the contract up Perfect. So yeah, there's, there's so much more to like, even with loans, like fixed rate interest rates where, you know, you're paying this specific amount versus a variable rate interest rate, which is going to fluctuate with prime, which we're seeing because prime's gone up, how this is insane for a lot of people who were borrowing, you know, low cost on a line of credit. And now prime has gone up and it's a couple percentage points more than what they had initially thought it would be. So it's there's a lot to it and it can seem overwhelming but just know that there's help out there for you and if you don't understand number one thing please 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 ask the question until you do like I had one client and I (laughs) I loved it so much but he kept saying I'm I'm sorry like can we do this again and I was like yeah let me figure out a different way to say this because it is so important for me that you understand what we're talking about and you're comfortable with it so I could say something like, for example, with the the tax-free savings account, RSP, as the house analogy, and that sits with a lot of people. And some people were like, huh? No, (laughs) I don't want a house. And I'm like, but I love it. I love it. Not house. And you don't have to do it in different. Yes. And then I literally said it in the most complex way I could think of. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. (laughs) It's like, ask the questions because there's so much information and it is important to understand it. Okay. So maybe this was a time as an FA, maybe it was a time in a uh, debt collection. Uh, so let me like, tell me about a time where you met with somebody our age now or older. Um, and I want to know what was their stressful time? You know, what was the debt problem and what would you like to say to them or have them know when they were 18 to 22 years to kind of maybe avoid that, uh, that circumstance? Yeah. Um, I had a client who she made almost triple what I made for her income. She was very successful in her career, a very prominent career. So like really just seemed like things would be all in order. And she came in because she was sick of her landlord. And she's like, I must be able to afford a house. And we were talking, I was like, yeah, this is like no brainer. We should be able to do something for you. Uh, ran her credit application to come to find she had about $110,000 of unsecured debt. Um, what happened is because of her income, she qualified for a lot of a lot of uh, credit, which happens. Like sometimes you go to the bank and even for me, I remember I went one time just to get a, a credit card that I liked the features of it and thinking like, yeah, maybe like a $2,000 limit would probably be good. And it was like 20,000 they said I could have. And I was like, oh, I think I'm good. <laughs> I don't want to cry like that, but that high of a limit, right? But that's what happens or you get pre-approved for things. And when you have a good credit rating as well, these things can come up. So she had a really great credit rating. The problem was she had so much unsecured debt. And I was like, tell me about this. Like, is, what is this? And the look on her face of confusion, like, I don't know. And it's like, you don't know where you spent 110000 And it's it sounds crazy. It's so easy to do, though. I I, I had clients who would be even $50,000 in debt, and they couldn't say 
or they'd say, well, you know, the wedding went on it and, oh, well, we had some trips and some expenses and it like, it piles up. It really piles up. I had a client who had $4,000 that they were owing on their credit card. And when we looked at the statements to kind of go over, okay, where's the bulk of your money going? It was, he was a bachelor and it was fast food. Like he spent just a crazy amount on going out to, you know, bars and, and McDonald's and stuff like that. And it's like lifestyle choices. So Mm. the advice I would say, the earlier you get a budget, the earlier you start saving because the easier it is truly. So I've had clients and it's heartbreaking where, you know, they're in their fifties and they're coming to me talking about wanting to start saving for retirement. And you kind of like, okay, this is going to be tricky. We're going to have to set some realistic goals around what your retirement is going to look like. But basically the sooner you start, the easier it is. And if you're saving for even nothing, if you're just saving that nothing savings could turn into your down payment. It could turn into your trip to Tahiti. It could turn into your engagement ring or your baby crib or whatever the hell you want your dream car. So there's nothing, there's no harm in saving money in a thoughtless way, let's say, where you're just like putting a bunch of money into savings. But when you're not doing that and when you're just spending slippery, slippery slope, And the thing that I think a lot of people don't talk about too is um, the shame that comes with people who are in debt. So you get people who will shame you sometimes, which please know in the bank, if you have, it's not going to happen, but if there is some jerk that did shame you, like talk to somebody else because we should be empathetic and understand what happens and that different things lead people into those paths. The point is, is, you know, there, it's like there's a saying something about there's a reason why, you know, your windshield is bigger than your rear view mirror. You can look in it to look back quickly, but you should be looking ahead. So number one, planning for the future. But the, the sooner you start, the easier it's going to be for you. The less you have to save because you have more years to save it over. Yeah, compound. if we're talking to our management learners right now, just stick in your calculator, 5,000 and like, um, what is it? Um, N equals 40. So the difference between like 25 and 65, N equals 40. Um, PV equals like 5,000 or 100,000 or whatever. And, um, you know, I of interest rate of like 7%. um, What else do we have? Uh, Oh, uh, zero payments and see what your future value is. And you will be like, so that's to say, like, if you graduate at 22 and you keep your lifestyle the same or similar and bank the difference, If you just save really hard for three years, you just, you don't get that car. Literally, you don't get that car. You don't buy that nicer apartment or that place. And you save a hundred thousand dollars, or let's even call it half as much. Look at that's your retirement. Literally, if you just do like, if you live the same way that you've been living between 22 and 25, put that away and then go fucking ham. Then just spend all your money and your retirement is paid for. Do that again with, um, and get your down payment. Like, figure out how do I make the best out of my 20s to set up the rest of my years because you can either have time or you can have effort, <laughs> um, but you can't you can't have it easy street in both. So yeah. like, thank you. I had no idea that we would circle back to the budget. Yeah. I'm so flipping pleased um, that we did because people don't, it's like, I'm going to mess up this quote, but it's um, Tim Ferriss tweeted it a while back and it's a quote attributed to somebody else, but it's like hard choices easy life, easy choices, hard life. And it's flipping true. Yeah. The the thing is too, is like, and I hate to be, you know, one of those people that's like social media, but I think it really has skewed the way that we think other people spend money because it's like, I saw this one thing, <laughs> this news article about how, um, what are they called? Influencers. Like there's a fake Jet oh, I, yes. that it's literally just for taking pictures in and I'm like what what world do we live in that I think you know if you ever saw a picture of me in a jet you'd be like 
nice one right it's like it's so unrealistic but there's this whole keeping up with it's not even keeping up with the joneses anymore it's like keeping up with the kardashians right and everybody thinks yes. like oh they spend their money on on this like oh gosh and i'm not shaming anyone it's choices that we all make but there was a, a co-worker i had who you know the amount of money that was spent on a purse and it was like oh my god like that where it is and like i bought my car new <laughs> like like, well, no, and I would be, ter- you know, because it, it's, it's just it, Kim Kardashian isn't spending her money on all of that. She's spending your money. <laughs> like, yes, she's yes. Like, or it's like the, these people get like free, free clothing because yeah. they're advertising it. And then yeah. you're paying $130 for a white t-shirt. It's, it's just very, I want you guys to think about your purchases. And, you know, if you need that $130 t-shirt, maybe get the $5 one first and see if you, if it's as good or, or yeah, address yeah, the yeah. issue of why you think you need the $130 one. Right. And well, yeah. I like it's that. Just very... And then see, did you get, what is that even 20, like 27, did you get 27 times more joy out of the 135 as the five? Like, Oh, yeah. and you know, so like ask yourself, have these experiments. And yeah. yeah. So sometimes, um, I remember I took a friend out for a birthday, um, and she was like, how did you spend, people, this is a while ago, uh, it was $80, we went to like a bar, it was Melrose in Calgary, and so we had a couple of drinks and something, yep. and it came to like $80 or 100 and she's like, man, how do you like afford all this and like go to school? I'm like, well, like I work part-time, blah, 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 and I'm like, and this is important to me, like I didn't go out for like yep. a month and a half yes. because I wanted to like go out with you, yep. um, but yep. maybe what we don't see is you know, people see you spend or you see people spend and it looks like, oh, this is what they're doing all the time. And maybe that's the case. And maybe it's not the case. So asking yourself for your situation, where are you going to make the trade-offs? And I, you know, having fun, like Jenny, some of my favorite (laughs) memories of us, especially, you know, after we were 18 is going to Starbucks, having a fancy ass coffee, but then like, you know, sitting and talking for hours, um, or going like just it's quality and it's the people and at the end yeah. of the day, you probably won't remember, you know, most of the meals that you have each year, but you'll remember a few key memories yeah. and the people. And so really putting your money um, yeah. where your memories are and setting yourself up for, for success in the future. And then just because you're budgeting now and you're being limited and mindful now doesn't mean you can't blow everything later. In fact, it probably gives you more ability to blow more later. You have more options. And the thing is, too, I forget who said it or where I heard it, but something along the lines of like, if you can't manage $10, you can't manage $10 million. So it doesn't matter. Like people think, oh, I have to budget because I'm poor. It's like, no, (laughs) no, it's got nothing to do with that. No matter what your income is, you have to budget for these things. And yeah, the numbers are different, but it's basically the same print said, it's important to me with your girlfriend at Melrose. It's like, yeah, certainly splurge on yourself in the areas where it's important. But a lot of people don't have that part where they go, okay, do I want to buy a $7 coffee every single day? Or with that money, I've added it up. I could actually go on my dream trip to Hawaii that I've wanted to go next year, which is more important. Maybe I'm going to make my coffee at home for a year and, or, you know, special occasion, have it once in a while, instead of just this well, everybody else is having it all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, but what does everybody else, <laughs> what's their bank account look like, right? Like we can't make assumptions that just because we went out for a nice dinner or this or that, like it's it's very personalized to what's important, but also at the same time, I want you to think about the reason that it's important. Is it important? Is that $130 shirt important because you saw this person wearing it or because it means something to you? If it means something to you, wear that shirt till you get buried in that shirt, right? Like, love it. That's fine. But I think that there has to be a lot more thought put into the way that we spend money. And I know for myself, it's interesting because back to the budget piece. Um, if you had said to me January of last year that it would be possible for me to not have my income and us to not have a lot of changes in regards to the necessity pieces in the budget, I'd have thought, I don't know about that. 
literally, <laughs> it just goes to show even me being in banking and stuff, we were spending money that it was like, hmm, whatever, you know, and, and so not watching where you're putting your money and it's easy to look back and go, oh my gosh, if I had just taken my entire income and thrown it into savings, where would we be? And it's like, that's that rear view mirror part where, yeah, you can look in it and kind of glance, but focus forward, <laughs> you know, don't beat yourself up for things that happened, learn from them, keep moving forward, reevaluate your goals always and talk about your, your financial goals. You know, like if it's not with your friends or family, like that's fine, but talk with your advisor or someone who's in the industry to be like, you know what? I really like, I've always wanted to go to this place or I've always wanted to have this car. I, I want to save for this. Perfect. Let's look at your budget and get that sorted out. And there is a lot of great resources on how to do budgets. Um, and I, we touched base on how different things for everyone. I think there are some basics though. So um, I don't know, should basics of what would make a good budget or how to do the budget or uh, about, probably not. How about so we link a few, we'll link a few things um, sure. in the show notes. So send me an email yeah. after and at the end, hey. um, I'll also link your email below if that's cool with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I want to know, like, so money as a tool, and we talked about budgets, uh, maybe rela relating or uh, related to money, maybe not, but um, just to like, bring in some levity. Jenny, what do you do for fun? Because I know I get pictures all the time and I'm like, Jenny is living her best life before, during, and after. <laughs> so you did while you were working, but like, yeah. what do you like to do for fun? Yeah. Uh, different things. I mean, it, I'm kind of a seasonal person. So if it's nice outside, I want to be fishing. I want to be hiking. I want to be laying in the grass, like love it outside when it's nice out. Um, if it's not so nice out, I don't want anything to do with outside. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I don't like the cold. I don't like the ice. I don't want anything. So when I'm cooped up inside, like now I like to do puzzles, love movies. Um, we do, we like to go to Disneyland. Disney is our like annual trip that we, you know, just unleash and be a kid and ride all the mountain rides and yeah. stuff. But uh, yeah, just, you know, nothing, nothing too crazy. I'm looking at, you know, potentially taking up some new hobbies when it gets warmer out, but uh, yeah, I would otherwise, blast. basic stuff. Um, I walking around your house last time I was visiting, I <laughs> thought and like a new talent that I like, I knew that you had been like, Oh, like we made our headboard and I saw your headboard and I was like, Oh, that's lovely. Oh, um, yeah. but then I'm like going around your house yeah. and there's all these things that I'm like, man, Jenny, like she must be like yeah. racking up like a bundle. And then you're like, we made this, we made this. Can you tell me like one, <laughs> or, one or two things that um, I'm talking yeah. about? Like, and how, like how? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. I do. I love uh, furniture. So my dad was really into making furniture. So, yeah. So uh, my desk that uh, my laptop's on right now. Um, yeah. Just, I, I like to upcycle as well. So like the headboard that we made for our bed is made with reclaimed wood. Same with a couple like end tables and uh, coffee tables. I'm looking at refinishing. I would refinished a desk before. So really like that. Uh, uh, hands-on like taking a piece of furniture that's either already been made and kind of revamping it or just taking pieces and putting them together and making them something so the desk thing happened because during COVID I was working from home and I, I didn't have a desk this used to be a spare bedroom and uh, I ended up just putting a piece of wood on top of um, two end tables at first you know just to have something to sit at and then I was kind of like okay well I can do something different with this or I can't what do I want this to look like if I if I could and then when you go out and go into stores and seeing like yeah that's way more money than I wanted to pay for it what would it be if I was to make it how much energy what kind of do I have the tools I need or whatever and uh yeah so that's definitely a a passion too <laughs> I love it I love it all righty um any podcasts or books or TV shows that you like, um, no parameters. Well, I mean, this podcast, <laughs> I, uh, I definitely, I don't, I don't watch any podcasts like religiously. I don't have one that's like, oh, I watch every episode of this. Um, I just kind of like 
I'll search for things if I'm in the mood and if something pops up, you know, like the Joe Rogans and yeah. crap like that, that kind of comes up, not crap, but you know, those kinds of things that come up, I'll watch those TV shows. As much as I love movies, I'm not a huge TV show person. I think so like, the Dead? only one I really no, I didn't. So I even, <laughs> what was that one? Uh, Prison Break. I watched it like 10 years after it had been on TV when it was on Netflix. So <laughs> I, I'm so late to the game on everything. When people talk to me about TV shows, I'm like, I don't know. I don't watch that. You're Simpsons like, that is again. like really, I like a show. <laughs> yeah. I like, you know, I can go maybe a month without watching it and still understand what's happening with, with them. But uh, definitely more of a movie buff for, for that kind of thing. I should have so, asked movies. I'm sorry. Well, like, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and I like all kinds of movies. I, you know, I've. I'd say probably favorite are like Indiana Jones, Star Wars, like something that's just escaping, you know, that's not, uh, I don't want to watch anything too heavy or, I mean, once in a while, there's something that you might want to, but I like, you know, I like those kind of movies to stop thinking about what's going on, not dread what's happening. (laughs) Yeah. Like, um, do you watch uh, like horror movies at all? I can't I like oh I, you, so oh, no. I'm like stop stop you know it's it's so funny because remember when we were in like junior high and it's like birthday party was like blockbuster rent a rent a scary movie and then like scary movies and it's like I had no problem when I was a kid watching scary movies if I watch a scary movie I watched um <laughs> the nun I watched the nun and for like two months I had nightmares it's so stupid it, like I did the reverse thing where I like as an adult but as a kid I was like boring <laughs> so weird yeah now whim. I'm like covers up to here like oh my god <laughs> so whim. yeah all right Jenny um second last question um I'm gonna be asking you one some people find this easy some people find this uh, a little bit more tricky so take your time but Jenny Greedy what is your definition of success yeah uh (laughs) tricky so that's a tricky one and actually something happened the other day where um it's funny me and my husband Leo were talking about this and he said do you feel successful and I was like feel successful that's really interesting and I, I I thought about it for a minute I was like yeah I I think that success is really a feeling and I'm starting to realize because the literal Jenny wants to be like success is setting a goal and reaching it you know but it's like I've set goals and reached them and not felt that great or not felt like what I thought and I also definitely didn't hit the mark on some things but still felt like damn like yeah look at uh, look what I did you know so I'd say it's a feeling inside and I think the goal is probably to try to recreate that feeling as much as possible I'm not entirely sure what the correlation is I think it might have something to do with surprising myself you know like where where I've seen growth or or something like um I learned how to solve Rubik's cubes (laughs) And I, I went on forever about it. I was like, oh my God, because it was something I thought I would never do. It seemed like magic to me, right? And and so it was something I was so proud of. And I just felt this immense amount of success because I took this thing that I thought I could never do and did it. But then, yeah, other big things that it's like when people have been like, wow, like good for you with accomplishments. Or I, I got this one award at work. I was recognized as the top individual. And I was kind of like, you know, and it's like, it doesn't give you that feeling or me the feeling of success. So yeah, I would say success for me is a feeling and I try to recreate it as often as I can, but uh, different, different things make it that way. I love that. I, 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 I don't even <laughs> want to like, t- I, I, I just, I'm like, I just want to end because I love it. It's yeah. um, personal. It's a feeling. And if I were to say anything, it'd be, it comes from within. So it's not um, external, yeah. you know, a pats on the head or whatever. It's uh, that internal drive and that internal feeling. So thank you. And yeah. thank you for yeah. coming on. I will, you know, oh, personally. Thanks for be- having me. <laughs> <laughs> As, um, we're going to link your email below. Um, 
if people reached out to you with an email with a question like, hey, this is what my FA, my financial advisor asked, or hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, or they just want to talk to you about Rubik's Cubes and they're like, how did you do this? Um, can people reach out? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing is, I think, um, you know, if you have questions about, I mean, I hope that you can trust your advisor, but certainly if, if you're not too sure you want to, you know, kind of bounce something off of me. Yeah. Give me a shout and just let me know <laughs> you found me from here. So I'm not like scammer, scammer, <laughs> delete, delete, delete. just say like, Hey, I saw you with Sam or I'm Sam student or something. I'm like, okay, cool. But uh, yeah, but definitely. That's a good caveat. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Sam.